thanks very much. It's been uh, wonderful being here today and uh, hearing so many inspirational presentations. Very daunting to follow some of them. And I think the uh, Tristan's presentation about marathons is a real metaphor for what, for what I'm trying to do, which is uh, to turn human ingenuity into oil. In 1898, about 100 years ago, 110 years ago, there was an international planning conference in New York, an urban planning conference. And although you might expect that they'd be talking about housing, land use, infrastructure and economic development as the dominant topics of discussion, they weren't. They were talking about the horse. And they were talking about, more specifically, horse manure, which is being dropped by the rapidly growing population of horses in the cities, which were very dependent on hundreds and thousands of horses for personal transportation, for moving freight and for mechanical power. And yet the uh, accumulation, uh, what happened uh, was that in the streets were accumulating from each horse each day uh, 15 to 30 pounds of manure and a quart of urine, which were not easy to cart away. In fact, to cart them away, they, they needed horses. So the manure was causing serious environmental problem, contamination, accidents and ill health in the horses as well as in the humans because unsurprisingly the manure attracted uh, millions and billions of flies which spread uh, bacteria causing diseases such as typhoid and other gastrointestinal diseases as well as many others. It was predicted there was so much, going to be so much horse manure in the streets that uh, in 30 to 50 years the horse droppings would have reached the third story of the buildings. <laughs> Yet there was no stopping the production of the manure because the horses had to eat, and in fact each horse ate about four tonnes of hay and oats every year. And in order to meet this need to feed the horses, they were clearing rural areas around the cities. Five acres of land had to be devoted to feeding each horse a year, and uh, this was taking away from feeding the humans. Uh, five acres of land per year would have fed six to eight people. So they were diverting land away from human consumption, clearing more land and, of course, diverting water. The conference, in fact, ended a few days early because the delegates could not find any possible solutions to this serious environmental problem. Ironically, uh, they couldn't find solutions despite the fact that the railroad industry was already developing using steam engines. They couldn't find solutions to part the fact that the internal combustion engine was already being developed by men whose names were to become household names, men such as Daimler, Otto and Benz. The delegates were not to know that uh, 10 years after their conference, the gasoline-powered Model T Ford would roll off the assembly line. The delegates were not to know that one of the uh, signature lines of Ford vehicles was to be the Mustang, which I've shown here, which, of course, is named after a particularly powerful breed of horse. The delegates were not to know that Orville Wright would power the first uh, airplane, would uh, pilot the first powered airplane flight in 1903 in uh, North Carolina. They were not to know that a company uh, of today known as Arian would be in the late planning stages for a highly efficient supersonic business jet that will fly from New York to Paris in four and a half hours. Arian is in fact uh, derived from the name used in Greek mythology for Orion, uh, who was the horse son of Poseidon. The horse theme is very strong. Orion was used in battle and uh, his speed saved the lives of his riders, uh, including Heracles. So here we are in 2011, meeting in Australia, whose capital cities have the po about the same population as did London and New York 100 years ago when the delegates were meeting in 1898. So if we imagine ourselves as being at an urban planning conference now, what would we be discussing? Well, we are discussing housing, land use, infrastructure and economic development. But we're also discussing, and the city of Sydney is a perfect example of this, uh, as the most urgent problem, the unintended consequences created by the horse, or more precisely, by horsepower. Horsepower, defined as the work done at the rate of 550 foot-pounds per second, or 745.7 watts. Horsepower that was first used as a unit of measurement to compare the power of a steam engine to the power of a horse. We've replaced our complete dependence for transport and for much of our uh, mechanical power uh, f 
displaced the oats and hay fed horse and replaced it uh, with our complete dependence on the fossil fed fuel internal combustion engine, particularly for our transportation. The fossil oil is what feeds our internal combustion engine and I need to explain what I mean by fossil oil. It's been mentioned a few times today. And the reason we call it fossil oil, that it, it comes from the vast oil deposits from fossilised organisms that were formed uh, 150 to 300 million years ago under very severe environmental conditions which included flood and high atmospheric CO2. The oceans were teeming with tiny photosynthetic organisms or plants known as algae. And as these algal blooms died off, they were buried by sediment deep uh, in the Earth's crust, cooked to a very high temperature. And because they are naturally rich in oils and fatty acids, the algae that were so sedimented and cooked formed the deposits that we know today as fossil oil. So during the last century, we've become completely dependent on fossil oil, as you, and you can see uh, a barrel of oil there on the slide. We're completely dependent on it for our particularly for transport that requires liquid fuel, such as gasoline, kerosene or jet fuel and diesel. And we're also completely dependent on the other components of the barrel of oil as a cheap source for most of the base materials that we use to manufacture chemicals, pharmaceuticals, plastics, detergents, solvents and synthetic fibres such as nylon and polyester. We've put fossil fuel to such good use that every second the world uses 1,250 barrels of oil. Our dependence uh, on oil for energy um, and on other fossil fuels such as coal has not been without unintended cons consequences, as you well know. The burning of fossil fuels has led to the direct emission of billions of tonnes of uh, greenhouse gases, including carbon dioxide, into the atmosphere. In fact, as has been mentioned already today, atmospheric CO2 in the last 100 years has risen by 100 parts per million. These greenhouse gases, as we know, create an insulation blanket around our atmosphere and lead to a rise in uh, atmospheric and ocean temperatures. And this slide, uh, taken from the NASA Goddard Space Institute, shows the pronounced increases, particularly during the last two decades. This has put us in a very high-risk situation for the health and welfare of our future generations. Even if you talk to people who are not convinced that combustion of fossil fuels has contributed to global warming, or indeed uh, whether global warming is a reality at all, er everybody is aware that we are running out of fossil oil. Uh, this slide here is um, showing uh, the results of uh, that peak of, peak of oil, at least peak as it relates to conventional sources of fossil oil, easily accessible or relatively easily accessible. We're being forced to drill for fossil oil deeper and deeper into the earth and further and further out into the ocean. And that leads to disasters such as shown on this slide, which is the oil slick from the recent leakage of 5,000 barrels a day for several weeks into the Gulf of Mexico from the BP Deepwater Horizon rig. And you get some idea of the size of this slick when you look at that little, uh, little white dot over in the top right-hand corner, which is, a, which is a plane flying over the oil slick. Because of peak oil, amongst other things, so we will need a different energy mix and, and particularly a different transport fuel mix into the future. And this slide shows the view of uh, one oil company, BP, of this mix going out to 2030. There'll be a decreasing contribution of oil, which is shown as the lime green, and an increasing contribution of renewables, which include biofuels, uh, the shown in turquoise. Biofuels, very simply defined as fuels made from organisms, such as plants, that are living today, rather than organisms that lived millions of years ago. If we're going to make biofuels uh, that reduce our greenhouse gas emissions at the same time, we're going to, be need to, be, we're going to need to be very clever, to be ingenious. Uh, and in uh, ri raising the question of human ingenuity, let me remind you of the history of mankind that has been one of accelerating technological change. Initially, each age, for example, the agricultural age of 7,000 years, spanned a very long time. But successive waves have decreased in time exponentially. In fact, the rate of change has uh, been so rapid that the ages have begun to overlap. 
And currently, as you'll see here, we're in the uh, information and communication technology and biotechnology ages, which began in earnest and in parallel around about 1971. The information age, as we know, has transformed our daily lives through the internet, our computers, iPods, iPads, mobile phones, global positioning systems, smart cards, and the myriad of other devices using microchips and, and other IT technology. The information age has, in fact, enabled the biotechnology revolution, which has produced spectacular breakthroughs in the prevention and treatment of previously incurable or untreatable diseases. These breakthroughs were made possible by the initial discovery of the DNA double helix and the four bases that make up the chemical composition of DNA, adenine, thymine, guanine and cytosine. And biotechnology products uh, developed on the base of this knowledge are used in patients with diabetes, heart disease, many forms of cancer, and many forms of viral infections, such as hepatitis virus, papillomavirus, and human Im immunodeficiency virus. And I should divert at this stage to tell you the reason I'm telling you about this is this is a field that's familiar to me. Now, I'm a physician by training and I've looked after patients with these diseases for many years and specialised, uh, as I was so doing, in the benefits and side effects of medicines. I've made inventions of my own in the biotechnology field, particularly in the area of treating patients with human, infected with the human immunodeficiency virus. And during my time working in biotechnology as a physician, I've marvelled at the successes in sequencing the entire human genome, initially from two individuals, two famous individuals, Craig Venter and uh, James Watson, who was one of the uh, discoverers of the DNA double helix, and now uh, for, from hundreds of thousands of individuals. The costs and the time to sequence a full human, human genome has, have fallen so dramatically that we reached a tipping point in 2009, shown in this, on this slide, when the cost of sequencing one genome crossed over the number of full genome sequences entered into the public database known as GenBank. So what I'm using these examples to show you are that uh, we do have a, uh, uh, what I'm using the examples to, to show you is to give you a clear insight into human ingenuity and some hope that maybe we do have enough ingenuity to solve some of these problems that we've been talking about today. As a physician, I have to work on uh, incomplete uh, bodies of data to do something, otherwise I have a dead patient. So I'm very much driven towards uh, creating solutions and hopefully not repeating some of the mistakes of history. Unfortunately, in creating uh, solutions in medicine, we've been so successful that the global population has ridden, risen steadily to its current uh, figure of nearly 7 billion. Uh, that's in the second bubble from the bottom on this slide, and uh, is projected, as we've also heard several times today, to reach, to reach 9 billion by 2050. This growth in uh, human population will greatly increase global demand in, on OECD figures for food by 35%, energy by 37%, and resources by 70%. And on the right-hand side, you see, uh, as was happening in the case of uh, having to feed the horses in, in 1898, uh, we are facing a decreasing supply of biologically productive land per person, a decreasing supply of water, nutrients such as phosphorus, and a decreasing supply of energy in the form of fossil oil. Fossil oil is something we don't notice, but we, are, we need it every day. We couldn't have got to the conference without fossil oil. Uh, for example, we need to make our own oil. We need to make oil in a way that doesn't consume these scarce resources or contribute to the growth in greenhouse gas emissions. These are the big challenges that uh, I think about every day. So where uh, can we overcome the challenges? Well, Australia's in a, in a fortunate position uh, in order to um, overcome the challenges. In order to make biofuels, we need to grow plants. And as we've heard, terrestrial and aquatic plants grow by photosynthesis, which is the chemical process by which they capture CO2, and they use the energy of the sun to convert the CO2 into biomass. Or, uh, into biomass. So we're fortunate in Australia in that we're in the band of equatorial countries with lots of sunlight, as shown in the, in the red, 
and uh, our agricultural sector is also very already successful in producing millions of tonnes of biomass, but we could produce more. If we're going to produce biomass or feedstock for biofuels, though, we have to make certain that, that they meet certain stringent criteria, which I've shown on this slide. They need to be uh, high have high hectare productivity. They can't compete for arable land. They can't uh, compete with our need to make, to grow food and uh, to, uh, to make fibres and all of the other products from, from uh, arable land. They have to utilise and preferentially remediate water sources that are not fresh, that are contaminated, polluted or that can't be used for growing food. We have to make these biofuels while at the same time ensuring that when we combust them, our overall emission of greenhouse gases is less than is 50% or less than if we were burning fossil fuels. The fuels we make have to drop into our existing infrastructure, drop into our refineries, drop into our distribution systems, drop into our engines without requiring modification of what we've built up over many years of billions of dollars worth of, uh, of capital expenditure. We have to make sure that the biofuel uh, feedstock is a good technology platform to replace all the other components of a barrel of oil. Otherwise, we're still going to be needing fossil oil to make the other components, such as the chemicals and pharmaceuticals. We have to make these biofuels, this is a great challenge, at uh, cost parity and, uh, or, or uh, cost advantage to petroleum fuels, otherwise we won't be able to afford them. And it, we also have to ensure that we scale the production of these uh, biofuels to very large production volumes. So have we got any feedstocks that can, that can even give us a chance of getting there? Well, we have one um, in the form of uh, microalgae. It's a very strong option. Uh, there are 40,000 species. They're the world's fastest growing plants. They're everywhere in water courses, both fresh and salty. We don't really notice them, but they're out there in that pond out there. They account for over half the biomass produced in the world. They take up millions of tonnes of CO2. They can turn contaminated water into drinking water by soaking up all the, uh, all the pollutants and organic material. They love to make oil. Uh, oil with an even higher energy content than fossil oil, and the oil they make can be turned into gasoline, diesel and jet fuel. In fact, since uh, 2008, there have been jets and small planes powered by biofuel derived from algae uh, flown in demonstration uh, flights. The oil they make is low in pollutants, such as the sulphur and nitrous oxides. And as I've mentioned uh, already, they meet the other criteria. The oil they make can be used to make all the other components that we currently derive from a barrel of fossil oil. When we've extracted the oil, we have a leftover content of starch and uh, protein, which can be used for a number of other uses, importantly, animal feed and, and under certain circumstances for human nutritional supplements. We're aware that particularly the Asian populations already consume vast amounts of uh, microalgae as, nu as nutrition. So wh where are we in, in this um, plan to make oil from, uh, from microalgae? Well, we have a number of initiatives in Australia. Here's, uh, here are some microalgae being grown in research facilities in, um, in Adelaide. I see I've run out of time. Um, here are algae being grown in more industrial con conditions in the James Cook University in Townsville. In fact, the sun here is so intense that they need to be uh, kept under the shade. And here are some algae grown in open ponds in Karratha, which you recognise by the uh, red dirt. And open ponds are the most economical way to, uh, to produce algae at scale. So the industry is fledgling, but it is taken off. The big questions, though, um, apart from the insignificant question that I started off with is, can human ingenuity make oil, to which I assume you now have the answer. The answer is yes. The big questions are, what land area will we need? Uh, can the green crude be delivered at price parity to fossil oil and with margins that can be profitable because there's no point in making it if uh, people can't make money? And um, I'll skip this slide, which is to say that uh, Australia is predicted to be a significant player in microalgae and leave you with this uh, final conclusion slide, which is human ingenuity can make oil. 
uh, what keeps me up at night now is how many barrels a second can we possibly produce. Thanks. <laughs>